in the face of environmental concerns, which are so real with the BQE um, and technological innovation, we need grand plans for our future transportation systems, and BIG has devised just such a plan. Founded by Mr. Ingalls in 2005 in Denmark, this architecture and planning firm now has a major presence right here in our community in Dumbo. BIG has garnered international plaudits for its work, and many of you will recognize its name in con connection with the Via 57th Street West, the dramatic residential building on the west side near the Hudson River, uh, and for the Big U, the resiliency plan to protect lower Manhattan from catastrophic flooding. Those have been their projects. BIG is here tonight to present its BQP proposal, uh, which goes well beyond just a design for a new highway. BIG is committed to developing social infrastructure, a design approach which considers how the built environment can enhance wider human needs. BIG has the expertise to come up with solutions for those pinch points, those purple points that Mark was showing us, um, as well as engineers that can assess the study, the proposed feasibility, and I enthusiastically support their work. Please welcome now Jeremy Siegel, the lead architect from BIG, who will present BIG's proposal in a public forum for the very first time. All right, thank you so much, Mark, for that very warm welcome, and good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jeremy Siegel. I'm an associate uh, with BIG. Uh, we're based here in Dumbo. I'm joined uh, by our technical partner here, Peter Gluss, uh, with Arcadis. Uh, they are a design and engineering consultancy based in New York City and the Netherlands. Um, and I have to say that just, uh, you know, when, when, when we heard that Mark Baker had been working on this triline idea, we, we were already a bit into our work. And we were really thrilled because we thought if the same idea develops in two places at once, you know there's something to it. So uh, we're, uh, we're really happy that there's alignment there and we hope, <clears throat> we hope there'll be alignment with you all. Um, and before I get into uh, kind of exactly how we, we arrived uh, at the BQP plan, um, I just want to give a little bit of background as to how we kind of got ourselves into this. Um, we are about 250 people in Dumbo, to the Manhattan Bridge back there. Um, we are architects, urbanists, landscape professionals, researchers, uh, and uh, we work on a, a kind of wide range of projects. Um, a lot of us live in the neighborhood. I myself live on Willow between Orange and Cranberry, so I use the Esplanade uh, every day. Um, uh, Bjarka, uh, uh, our founder, lives in the neighborhood, and, and a whole lot of us are here. So we've been seeing the development of the project. We've been watching uh, uh, with bated breath. Um, and at a certain point, we, we sort of looked at it and thought, you know, we, we think about waterfront uh, and coastal infrastructure so much. Um, we've been working on the Big U for the last six years. I've been directing that work uh, since uh, Hurricane Sandy and the Federal Rebuild by Design effort that's looking at several miles of coastline uh, along uh, lower Manhattan. We've been working with the communities of uh, the Lower East Side. Uh, for those six years, really understanding how we can create resiliency, but also better connect the neighborhood to the waterfront, how we can work with the highway and, and, and sort of uh, in, improve access. Um, and we've been working on a whole range of other kind of infrastructure master planning efforts around the country and the world, um, together with Arcadis on, on some. Uh, <clears throat> so it's something that really kind of runs uh, in our blood. Um, as I said with the Big U, uh, it's been six years, and so we're no stranger to interagency coordination, working with the community, understanding how uh, community needs and desires can shape uh, a big infrastructural plan. Um, so we really kind of wanted to jump into it. So um, about uh, a month and a half ago, uh, we, we decided that we would do a pro bono study on this, um, see what we could come up with if we thought a little bit outside of the constraints that had been set forth uh, in the city's current proposals, and see what we can do if we think, sort of not about what we can't do and all the reasons we can't do something, but you know, what's possible if we actually coordinate in the right way. Um, the structure itself is something we're fascinated by uh, as architects, the triple cantilever, um, as well as the, the kind of story uh, of the neighborhood uh, pushing the, the highway from Hicks Street out to the waterfront and demanding the esplanade. So uh, we're, we're wondering if there might be a, a happy sequel here. 
Um, and, you know, we all know that uh, the, the structure is corroding. Um, by 2026, if it's not repaired, trucks and then cars will, will start to be forced off of it. So the city has been acting, you know, with, uh, with urgency. It's an urgent life safety issue. Um, and um, the, the constraints that they've been working with are really organized around that. At the same time, we want to make sure that the short-term and long-term impacts of this 100-year or more investment uh, are the right ones. A lot of cities around the country and the world have already uh, thought about their coastal highways. This is the Embarcadero in San Francisco, for any of you who have been there, which just a few decades ago had uh, the Embarcadero Freeway. Uh, during the Loma Prieta earthquake, it was uh, uh, decided to be demolished, uh, and then we have the, the wonderful public spaces that are there today. Uh, even on uh, Manhattan's own west side, uh, as early uh, as uh, the 1970s, we still had an elevated viaduct. A truck crashed through it at some point, and it was decided to place it at grade and to build the four and a half miles of Hudson River Park that we have today. So this is something that happens in cities um, as we rethink our, our infrastructure. And I think it, it's easy to kind of get fixed in the way things look today, but if you go back just over 100 years ago in Brooklyn Heights, we had a very different condition one where we had a really strong connection to the waterfront, uh, in this case for port operations, um, and not for the kinds of things that we're doing today, but nevertheless a strong connection, and this almost poetic, uh, kind of inspiring interlacing of the cliffside, the water, and the city. <clears throat> so, to jump right into it, uh, these are the conditions that we have along the main stretch, which Mark Wooters and others have, have been taking you through, where we have the triple cantilever, Furman Street, the parking strip, and the sound attenuating berm. Um, DOT's uh, current proposals are looking at sort of um, trying to limit encroachment on that right-of-way, so working within uh, a sort of established jurisdiction. Uh, the, the construction happens uh, below, or the deconstruction happens below, and then the park is placed above uh, six to eight years uh, later. So um, while there are ways to find uh, you know, other solutions to, to stage that construction, what we want to understand is, is there a way that we can actually create this as a piece of social infrastructure? So not just you know, uh, repairs of an aging highway that then accommodates cars, but how can we double and triple and quadruple those investments so that they're working overtime? So we've been thinking of our approach uh, as how do you go from the BQE, the BQ Expressway, to the BQP, the BQ Park. Um, and it starts exactly in the same place uh, that Mark Baker uh, started, uh, looking at this underutilized corridor uh, alongside the back of the berm. So the first stage would include construction of that at-grade highway while traffic is still running on the existing BQE. This could start very soon uh, with a retaining wall in the back side of that sound attenuating berm. Uh, a deck would be constructed over that, and once the deck was completed, uh, traffic would be rerouted through. These would be very simple, prefabricated beams and columns, uh, a lower structure than the elevated tempway, so we think that there are some savings here in terms of complexity and cost. <clears throat> and then the park would sort of slide over that deck, <clears throat> um, which then leaves you with a series of kind of options for how you deal with that cliffside. Um, one idea, as, as Mark Baker identified is to uh, sort of turn into the tri-line, this idea of preserving the existing structure and making it into a linear park. Um, we could put in uh, park amenities and other kinds of uses if that were desired. We have a local access road here, which becomes Furman Street, basically, jumping on top of this deck and still taking you from the north to the south. And interestingly, if you look back at the early plans for the BQX line, uh, there was actually a spur running down Furman Street. Uh, when the planning advanced, that spur was eventually taken out of the plan, uh, we assume because there was no corridor for it. But in this case, you'd be creating a corridor for BQX as a light rail line if that's something that were desired. Um, and in the case that the BQE cantilever itself is deemed unfeasible or too costly to sort of repair and preserve in place and make into a park, there are other options for how we could reconstruct that cliffside. An, uh, one, uh, just sort of uh, community uh, and neighborhood uses uh, at either end of the park. Uh, another sort of getting rid of the more troublesome parts of the structure and making it into a, more of a landscaped condition. Um, or another, uh, interestingly, uh, when, you, <clears throat> when you take uh, the BQ and demolish it, you can actually take the, the rubble, crush it up uh, into compact fill, and then use that as fill for a new stabilized slope that would bring you down from, from the heights to the park. Um, we are displacing some parking along this route, so we could find space for it. Uh, we could either accommodate just the parking in the park or more parking for the neighborhood, if that's something that we're desired. We're really trying to put a menu of ideas uh, out here. 
Um, so this gives us this, this kind of menu uh, that we can mix and match. Uh, this is the existing uh, condition. If you can hear it, it might be a little bit low. And I'm not sure if the audio is coming, but uh, we also took some audio down by like six or we're further away from the BQE, and uh, you, you get the sense that this is how we can now count. Uh, we can take the emissions that are coming from it and treat them with a little bit of, of a space for north south mobility, as well as uh, 10 or more acres of park that are now continuous. With. You have 360 firm in here, the Brooklyn Bridge Park headquarters in the four-story Transit Authority building, uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park Maintenance and Operations, which was just built, the MTA fan plant at the AC, as well as a series of subsurface utility lines running along Furman Street. In addition, when you uh, start to, to look at an at-grade highway, you've got a few other constraints that are triggered. Uh, you have the MTA fan plant for the R train, the MTA electrical substation just north of it, and then uh, 130 Furman Street here. So we've been going through all of these and understanding them in cross-section, understanding them uh, from a technical point of view, and understanding basically just how to address each and every one of these issues. Um, to give you a sense of some of the, you know, so, so, some of the, the real constraints that we have to work with and address, the MTA substation is one of those constraints which would have to move up. From a technical point of view, this is something that happens. Uh, it's possible. Uh, we'd be raising it uh, further out of the floodplain, so there'd be some resiliency benefits there. Um, and it would co require coordination with the state uh, who controls MTA. So this is, again, one of those coordination points. Uh, the MTA fan plant at the R train, these have uh, sort of uh, tubes that go all the way down, so we're really trying not to, to touch these. Um, and we actually have <clears throat> just enough space here uh, for the fan plant. Some of those of you who are really familiar will know that there's an apron in front of it with a series of manholes, which is required for access. So by using our shoulders as kind of a gasket, which can expand and contract uh, for those constraints, we'd be able to, to provide that access. Uh, the Brooklyn Bridge Park headquarters building, it's like a four-story building, brick, um, some of you may be familiar, is one of those uh, constraints that would have to go. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of the uh, pieces of collateral damage, but okay, I guess that's not a big deal <coughs> for most of you. Uh, Jeralaman Street, it starts to get interesting. Uh, oops, sorry. So here, uh, you've got the wine shop here on the corner. You've got Jeralaman Street here, uh, and then you pass under that, uh, that bridging structure. So here, the deck would actually continue, and we think we can continue the deck past 360 Furman, and I'll take you through that in a little bit. But at Jeralaman, basically, there's the question of, you know, what, how do you get up and over it? So what we're thinking at this moment is that the least impactful solution on the Jeralaman Street side would be to actually create a cul-de-sac for cars. So it'd be, uh, it wouldn't be the same through access for cars that you have today, but you would keep a sort of stepping ramp and stair structure with green that would take people up and over the deck and into the park. Um, on the park side, um, some of the feedback we've gotten from the outreach over the last few weeks is that um, keeping access uh, for cars and for the bus in particular up and over would be desirable. And it's something we think we can accomplish given the kind of uses that we have at the ground floor of that building. So this is kind of our working assumption right now at Jerolaman Street. Um, at one Brooklyn Bridge Park, uh, this is the condition that you have today where you basically have three stories of parking and then you do have a lobby, a wine shop, a couple things on the edge, but basically the base of this building is parking. So in the current plan, there would be a temporary elevated structure. This is uh, the, the city's current plan. A temporary elevated structure that would be built in front of the first several stories of residences. Uh, the structure underneath would be reconstructed and it would go back to some kind of condition um, uh, that, that might be similar to today. What we're looking at is a lane by lane uh, deconstruction and reconstruction where we would start with the southbound lane. We create the first half of a box which would sit next to the building we would either route north and southbound traffic through that box or 
Uh, another thought we've had more recently is that because we're building this box, we could actually get a little more capacity by stacking it if we're able to solve the transitions at the ends. So this might be a solution for getting more throughput during construction, which we've heard is a concern of a lot of people who live in this area. <clears throat> um, but the final result would actually be a new ground level for 360 Furman. And we know that you know, this can be uh, a little uh, shocking or you know, difficult to, to digest sometimes, but if you understand the base of this building, um, what you'll see is that you're actually creating a new ground level. The, the lobby would be pushed up to the second or third level, and basically the residences would no longer be looking onto or hearing or smelling uh, the highway. They would be looking onto a linear park. <clears throat> Um, and finally, as we move to the south uh, along Atlantic Avenue, uh, this is the existing cross section at Atlantic Avenue where we have the bridge, we have Pier 7, uh, we have uh, this kind of no man's land where you've got the clover leaf and, and the intersection there. We're looking at an option that actually continues that deck. Um, now, many of you know that right past this, the, the BQE sort of ramps down and into the trench. So we could actually start that ramping sooner even fully submerge it sooner so that Atlantic Avenue can just slide right over the top and eventually this matches into the trench. And this basically allows you to create a new intersection which is completely continuous. So as you walk down Atlantic Avenue, you're walking in city, you're walking in city, you're walking in city, and then you're in the park, rather than city, no man's land, park. <clears throat> Uh, to give you a sense of what that looks like in 3B, this is Atlantic Avenue, Pier 7, Pier 6. The 360 Furman co-op here is kind of ghosted, so you can see what's behind it. Van Voorhees Playground is here, which we've heard needs a lot of work. Um, so the phasing is that the southbound lane would be deconstructed first, while traffic is rerouted to the northbound lane, but running both directions. Uh, once that's completed, traffic would be rerouted to the southbound lane, connecting to the new at-grade highway up here, while the northbound lane is deconstructed. Uh, once that is done and the deck cap is built, traffic would be rerouted in both directions. And then we would kind of jump the park over Atlantic Avenue, uh, create a couple of opportunity zones for sort of city fabric to move through, uh, better access for Van Voorhees uh, a playground, and you know, we could really rethink this whole area as a cohesive unit. For those of you that know this area, it's huge, so this would really be transformative. And the coolest thing is that uh, uh, when I won't say if, but when the BQE is eventually capped uh, along Cobble Hill, we would be creating the beginnings of a linear park, which would actually stretch from first the Brooklyn Bridge to Atlantic Avenue, and then from uh, the Brooklyn Bridge and Dumbo all the way to Red Hook, which would be quite an amazing thing. <laughs> And finally, uh, to the north uh, at the MTA fan plant and AC for the AC line uh, and the Pier House residence, the trick here is really how do you go from two at-grade lanes to two stacked uh, lanes? So how do you make that transition? So I won't go through the details here, but we've been looking at it both. We have two solutions, one in plan, one in section. And basically, the, the southbound roadway would excavate down a bit so that you get clearance, and then they would both climb together. And then the deck would actually climb with that so that in the 3D, looking here, this is Pier 2, uh, this is uh, the Pier House, I live here somewhere. Uh, <clears throat> at grade roadway built here, southbound deconstructed here. While this is happening, traffic's running on the northbound lanes, but it's running in both directions. Uh, we then sort of switch sides as we did before, route everything through the new system, and then the park is placed on top with Furman Street running up and over, and now a new connection from the Columbia Heights Bridge straight down into the park, which is a really condition that, different condition than you have today. <clears throat> so kind of all in all, combining all of those elements, showing how the phasing works along the whole system. I won't go through the details here. Uh, and what's the payoff? So for the repairs, we're, we're, we're kind of carrying two scenarios here because we're not sure what the condition of the BQE structure is. Uh, one of them is uh, more the tri-line idea where the existing structure is kept in place. It's turned into a linear park with amenities. We have Furman Street, the BQX, 10 acres of new park, and Brooklyn Bridge Park with the north and southbound lanes running below. Here's an overview of that same concept. 
And then the second scenario, where uh, we demolish the BQE structure itself, compact the rubble, create a new cliffside, integrate parking, and have the same kinds of amenities uh, in this scenario as well. So, so, so those are our thoughts right now. Um, first, I, I also just want to thank our team who's here. I think a lot of you here maybe raise your hands or shout or something. <laughs> Um, but before we end, I want to turn it over to our, our engineer here, Peter Gless, to go through some of the technical sort of uh, details with you. Thank you, Jeremy. So as Jeremy said, I got involved a couple weeks ago, and um, we love this plan, we love the scope of this plan, and what we're trying to do is just sort of begin to dig into the details to understand critical flaws and to just to get a sense of comparison between really the options that are out there right now. So, uh, you know, for sure this concept that Jeremy's talking about has a significant benefit from a feasibility perspective, from a cost perspective, from the community perspective, and from coordination perspective. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, feasibility. It's a simple structural approach. It's easier to build something at grade than it is to build something elevated, right? Um, it deconflicts the construction from a community and an active traffic, minimizes or eliminates the temporary roadway, um, avoids sensitive historical areas completely, and it minimizes the parkland alienation. From a cost perspective, um, reduce roadway construction costs, build it once, not twice, right? When your permanent structure is your temporary structure, you save a lot of money and you save a lot of time, right? Um, reduce cost of uh, structural systems, again, at grade, simplified decking, and um, opportunities for diversified funding and the programming possibilities. Uh, community benefits, uh, reduce construction impacts, preserves the historical promenade, vastly improves the waterfront condition, creation of a new park, improved um, north-south and east-west connectivity, improved sound and air quality, Right, the finished product is an open space, a landscape, a neighborhood extension, as opposed to a, uh, a triple decker, you know, traffic conveyance system, <laughs> which is a really different way. <laughs> um, opportunity for the community, potential for BQX light rail, creates potential for continuous linear park connecting the Brooklyn Bridge to Red Hook. So what this is is a comparison because all of these options have a lot of complexity, for sure. Right, Jeremy and I have been. We've been working on this for about a month, a couple of weeks. As you get into the details of all of these options, they become complex very quickly, right? And so what we're trying to do is have a relative comparison just to get a sense of how these things stack up. And what this chart is, is just a basic comparison of risk. And I want to just focus on really the top four rows, which is about project cost, cost overruns, project duration, and time overruns. And when you take Jeremy's concept, Big's concept, and you compare it to the other three, what you get is you get significantly beneficial scoring because the base cost is likely cheaper because you don't have to build a temporary and then a permanent, and you're building at grade, and not in an elevated way, right? So that base cost starts in this way. Then the cost risk associated with the project has less of a likelihood of overrunning during the course of the project because you're not facing the same degree of complexity with construction and with staging, right? So we've seen a lot of projects in New York that have base costs and they have cost overruns because of the complexities. What this is saying is that from a comparative standpoint, this proposal really has an advantage in terms of simplifying the staging and the phasing. From a scheduling standpoint, again, when you're building the permanent and the temporary, and they're converging, you get a scheduling benefit, and that's pretty significant. And so what that means is that the initial schedule might be reduced, and the schedule risk itself might be reduced because you don't have this volatile element. The base proposal involves constructing that elevated highway over the triple cantilever partially active. We all would recognize the difficulty of doing that and the potential of disruption and the potential of schedule slippage as they try to stage that over active roadways, right? This proposal minimizes a lot of that risk. 
So just think, uh, uh, just a bit in coordination here, cross-jurisdictional cross coordination, city and state. Um, I think Mark pointed this out. Um, the elevated deck already touches parklands, and basically what we're talking about here is um, having that coordination be a necessary thing, but then ending up with a product that extends the interests of parks as well as the DOT. Um, and we believe that permitting, scheduling, design, built, and approvals really is something that could be used for any of these alternatives, but it's certainly consistent with the one that Big is talking about. So, with that,